Welcome to Cultural Business and Entertainment. We're here with Harold Owsley and Gwen Michaels of the Harold Owsley and Circle of Friends, and the subject today is jazz and business. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting us, Gary. Harold, we've known each other for a while now, and uh, we had a chance to break bread together, and That's I feel right. like I can ask you some questions of a somewhat personal nature about your business and about music. Uh-huh. How long have you been a musician and how long have you been interested in music? Well, I've been playing professionally since 1948 in Chicago. Uh, I got started in high school, but prior to that time I had an uncle. Uh, his name was Guy and he liked music like jazz. And uh, he used to play jazz recordings on, on the uh, Victrola for me. And uh, I got a chance to hear uh, Jimmy Lunsford, Fletcher Henderson. And I got the chance to hear the saxophone, which was an instrument he especially loved. And I fell in love with it. And when I got in high school, I had an opportunity to start playing it. Prior to that time, uh, my grandmother gave me uh, piano lessons. Because uh, when I came up, that was very popular. Most of the families would give piano lessons you know, to sons and daughters. And uh, so I played piano for a while, and then when I got into uh, high school, I started off on clarinet. Uh, in Chicago, uh, uh, the uh, person who was the uh, teacher, Walter Diet, he would always start uh, you off on clarinet because that was the basic instrument for the reeds for the saxophone, because you got three registers in clarinet. And uh, within that, those three registers, the saxophone registers within there. So when you learn how to play clarinet, you automatically can play the saxophone. Whereas the other way around, you can play saxophone but not clarinet. So I started out on clarinet and in, in swing band, I started playing saxophone. Harold, you write a good deal of the music for your band. Uh, how do you think of these melodies? Different things I hear. Sometimes I, I will hear music, uh, maybe go out to hear a uh, band in a club play and be inspired by you know, music I've heard them play, or hear something on a recording, or maybe even hear something on TV. And uh, it will give me an idea for a song. I might say, I'd like to write something like this. But then I have to think of something that has its own individuality. And uh, then I begin to, something will come to me. And as the melody line comes, I begin to change different parts because sometimes it doesn't all come at one time. I might like a few bars, the next few bars I may not like. And then I just keep searching and finally it begins to come together and I get a complete song. And if the melody is the kind of melody where I feel that I could put a lyric to it, then I begin to, to think about lyrics for it. In the same way about lyrics, you know, I have to keep changing around until I can get something that feels comfortable. Gwen, you and I just met today, but I know you're very important to the group. Can you talk a bit about your own musical background and, and how you met Harold? How did I meet you? <laughs> oh, you know where we met? <laughs> where in, did we in, meet? In uh, Brooklyn at Pumpkins. Yes, yes. We yes. were working together at a right. club called Pumpkins. Yes, that's how I met Harold. And we just clicked. And uh, I love working with him. I do a lot of the... Uh, music suites that he has. He has something called uh, uh, Music Suite and also the History of Jazz. We do the History of Jazz throughout the Queens and Brooklyn school system and uh, his Music Suites, as a matter of fact, we just did one uh, on Sunday at, uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't Abyssinian. Sunday. It was Tuesday Saturday. at Saturday, Abyssinian. I've lost track of time <laughs> coming from Osaka uh, at Abyssinian Baptist Church. Is jazz your primary repertoire, or do you sing other kinds of music as well? I sing all kinds of music, but jazz is my favorite, yes. Is the music business a profitable business, or can it be? Oh, definitely, it can be, sure. Uh, it depends, uh, you know, how it goes with each individual. If you can get in touch with people that can promote 
what you're doing, good agent, good record company, uh, you can you, know, you can benefit financially. Uh, of course, when things get uh, kind of tight or conditions, the economy gets bad within the country, music tends to suffer. Be one of the first areas, especially with jazz. And because when people have, uh, when they don't have a lot of money to spend and they have to be selective where they want to spend it, then they don't go out as much, they don't buy as many records. You know, and um, a lot of the younger people uh, are not familiar with uh, a lot of the artists that, for instance, that, that I knew about, like Lester Young, and the Count Basie Band, and the big bands. Uh, programs like I do in the schools help to familiarize uh, young people with that music because it's very important for them to know that uh, jazz is an important music because it is. It's a music that was created in this country, which makes it an important part of the American music culture. And uh, so they begin to hear what the music sounds like because a lot of times uh, they're only exposed to a certain kind of music. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, jazz is a kind of music that when anyone really hears the music and listens with an open mind and an open heart, they will like the music, they will become a jazz fan. And it doesn't stop you from liking any other kind of music that you like, it's just an additional music that you like because it has all of the elements in it that can console and inspire people. And because jazz is a very flexible music. It's uh, barred strains of music from, from concert music, from, from Latin music. You got bossa novas, you got all kinds of music. You've got some elements of classical music in jazz because musicians have used their creativity just to take a little bit from here and, and add something else to it. Because this is what jazz is, is creativity. Harold, you gave us a tape of your big band performance and we're going to show a little bit of that now.
big sound, Harold, and a very familiar tune. Uh, what was the name of that? That was a tune written by Billy Strayhorn called The A-Train, made very popular by Duke Ellington. Harold, I talked to a couple of musicians who've been around New York for a while, and they both knew who you are. Oh, really? They were. They both said that you were part of uh, the folklore of the city. So how does it feel to be part of the history of New York jazz? Well, it, it feels good to uh, you know, to hear you say that, to hear anybody say that. I'm not normally aware of this. You know, a lot of times when you're striving for something, you know, what you're striving for is, is that next level. So you, you don't, it's not a feeling where well, I've made it, I'm there, or I'm a part of history or I'm successful. You're trying to make that next level. And a lot of times you may not even be aware of how many people are aware of you. You know, because a lot of times you're trying to get places where maybe it takes a little time to get there. Sometimes you hear no more than, than you hear yes, uh, okay. And it seems like, well, you know, you know, it's difficult. It's almost like who knows me, uh, you know, people not accepting what you do. Or even if you know that people are aware of you, it's still another level that you're trying to get to, you know. And so a lot of times you're not aware of how people see you. So a lot of times I'm, you know, surprised to hear people say, you know, certain things. I just, it's always a pleasure to hear that. You have a band called Circle of Friends. How many people are in that group? It varies, <laughs> <laughs> depending on what kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, presentation I'm having. Usually with the Circle of Friends, it's uh, two singers, which one is Gwen, sometimes. Uh, uh, Bertie Green, very fine singer, was uh, the other singer I had with me at Apicenia. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, Paul Ramsey on bass, Paul plays with me quite often. And James Wideman plays with me quite a bit on the piano, very fine pianist. And Earl Grice, very fine drummer, he's been working with me recently. But usually there are maybe about three or four drummers, three or four piano players, bass players that know my repertoire and that are able to play in case somebody else is not available. Because we have done things where there have been, aside from Harold, there have been six or eight of us, you know, and then we've done things that have been condensed with five, but I think depending upon the instrumentation yeah. that he really feels like using at that time to really put his message across. Is it difficult to manage that many people to bring out a certain sound? Well, I usually try to get people who uh, are people who are cooperative, people who will give of themselves on all the necessary levels. Like it's, it's uh, not only important to be musically talented, but it's important to know how to get along, to have a certain congeniality. Because the more in harmony people are with each other, the more in harmony music is. Gwen, are the words to this music pretty well set, or do you do some ad-libbing as you go along? We want, <laughs> but it's not necessarily what the composer wants you to do. So I try to do his words. Sometimes I will uh, not remember his words, and mine will come up, and then I go back to his words. So yes, <laughs> I do a lot of ad-libbing sometimes. Do you write your own music and lyrics as well? Yes, I do. Uh, I write also, not only on my own, but with another piano player uh, that Harold knows very well. Uh, Ed Stout and I, we do a lot of things together too. I like to write. And when he was talking about writing earlier, where you don't, everyone thinks you sit right down and then you write a song. It doesn't happen like that. Sometimes the melody comes to you first, or sometimes the lyrics do, or part of the lyrics will come to you. And then the longer you dwell on it or you go away from it and come back, then you can finish it. 
I like to ask this question of artists, uh, and I don't really mean to put you on the spot, but what makes one musician or singer better than another? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. I'll let you, yes, I'll let you um, start. Well, you know, this depends on people's response to a singer's or a musician's style of performance. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that musician or singer is better mm -hmm. than another. It's just that the style that they have, uh, you know, in, inspires a response in the audience and the, and the way that they're delivering that particular style. Mm -hmm. And that begins to happen. And then usually people, when they become familiar with a person or a style, then it's like they begin to focus on that person. They want to hear more, and then people who are producing or uh, booking, they focus on that person. So you hear about this person a lot because uh, you know they're being promoted all the time, and they're out there, and people are coming to see them. So it's like a focus on that one person. And here may be several other people that perform just as well, but they don't have that opportunity to get center stage and there's no, there's no focus on it. So in the business, there are artists who are focused upon, but then there are hundreds of other artists just as well that you never hear about because the venues are so few and mm -hmm. far between, you know, uh, compared to the amount of artists. Mm -hmm. You know, here in New York City, if, if all of the artists, actors and everybody could be lined up, you'd have a whole <laughs> you know what I mean? They'd fill, you know, folk. yeah, mm -hmm. a whole arena, mm -hmm. you know, but you, you, there's so many you never hear about that are so talented because they don't get a chance to, to get center stage. I also want to add to that because uh, each of us has a mission and some reach their mission before others, not that they're better than the other but that their mission they must fulfill at that time. And depending upon our determination towards our missions in life, like some people just, for example, if you're going to be a doctor and then do you decide maybe after going through pre-med and then med school that I don't really want to do this, I really want to be a lawyer. Well, late, and then later you go back to that. It was your mission and you interrupted your mission, so therefore, your determination is what makes it happen for you, whether you are a singer that, or a musician who understands your calling and really love what you do and really want to do this and are determined to stick with it, not for fame or for profit, but for the love of music and because you feel that you want to share something with others just for a little while. I would agree with that as well. I feel that we are all here on this planet, we have a, a purpose, something to, to be fulfilled, to do. I feel that entertainers uh, and actors, uh, that we, part of our mission here is to console and inspire people. Because when people come out, they come out to, to enjoy it sometimes, to get away from, from problems or whatever, or just to have a, a beautiful experience. And the people that they go to see, whether they're actors or musicians, help to, to fulfill their life at that moment, to give them a certain experience that nourishes them. Mm -hmm. And I feel that this is what we should do, you know, wherever we are allowed to do it, whether we're making a thousand dollars, a million dollars, or whatever the salary is. If we can console or contribute to the happiness or enjoyment of the people who are there at that particular time that we perform, that then we're, we're you know, we're uh, fulfilling this mission, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and it's meaningful. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just at one moment somebody's inspired to do something, or maybe they were going to, they were just down in the dumps and didn't know what they were going to do next, or how long they were, could take it, and, and go somewhere and see something that, that inspires them and takes mm -hmm. them through that next day. What do you hope to accomplish in the coming years in terms of your business and your music? I would like to be able to do more recording on a, a consistent basis, uh, be able to uh, get my recordings you know, distributed uh, on 
national, uh, national and international level, and to be able to perform uh, internationally as well as nationally, you know, with my own group prior to. Uh, few, when I was in Europe before, it was with Count Basie at one time, another time I went with a show called Festival of Songs, the first time I went to Europe. So I would like to go back again this time with my own group. And now you're going to do a piece in the studio. Can you tell us what you're going to perform? It's, uh, one of the songs is called well, Hallelujah Bless My Soul, which has a particular message in it, which is, I think, uh, uh, good to develop self-esteem in terms of knowing who we are. I think that's very important. Once we can realize who we are and, and begin to love that, that can help to develop a sense of uh, uh, importance, self-importance and self-esteem. And that's the message that I'm trying to convey in that particular song. Then we have another song called Peace and Love, which I think is very important, especially for this time. And the message in that song is about the importance of peace and love. When
for being on the program. I think what you do is very exciting and, and very creative and uh, I think your insights and perspectives were, were fascinating and I thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you for yeah. having us. It was fun. It's our pleasure being here and once again thanks for inviting us. Yes. 